This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a renowned two-time gold record-winning pianist, vocalist, and recording artist who has a very prestigious connection to two show business legends, Liberace and Frank Sinatra. He was selected by Liberace to be his very last protege, and he is the only protege of Liberace's to receive the endorsement and support of the board of directors of the Liberace Foundation and the Liberace Estate. And the other superstar with which our guest shares an illustrious history is the chairman of the board, the one and only Frank Sinatra, who chose our guest when he was only 20 years old to be his piano accompanist. Our guest began his career in the 1970s as a child prodigy, performing concerts throughout the world, which led to a successful career in nightclubs, as well as in films and on television. And in 1981, Mr. Showmanship himself, Liberace, selected our guest as his last and final protege. He studied with Liberace for the last six years of his life. Our guest has performed at the most prestigious venues around the world. And besides performing with Liberace and Frank Sinatra, he's worked alongside dozens of superstars, including Rosemary Clooney, Dinah Shore, Bernadette Peters, Johnny Mathis, Debbie Reynolds, Jane Russell, John Travolta, and many more. With his incredibly versatile repertoire, which includes everything from the jazz classics, pop and country music to the great American songbook, our guest has given command performances for five American presidents, in addition to a number of crown monarchs in Europe, Asia and the Middle East. He's been featured in Cosmopolitan Magazine, The Hollywood Reporter, and on the cover of both TV Guide and the American music industry publication, The Score Magazine. He's also a contributing editor to Keyboard World Magazine, and he continues to serve as a consultant on books and film projects regarding both Liberace and Frank Sinatra. I'm delighted to welcome Steve Gary to our show. Steve, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Harvey. This is really an honor for me. I'm a big, big fan of your show. I have been for years. And this is really uh, great fun for me to be uh, included in your show today. Well, it's all my honor, I assure you. Steve, I know everyone is anxious to know, how did you meet Liberace? Here in Palm Springs, oh gosh, maybe 1979, 1980, something like that. I was performing uh, in town with my band and we had mutual friends and they uh, thought that that Liberace and myself had sort of the same sense of humor and that he would be uh, intrigued with my band and, and my piano work. And so uh, I was invited to a dinner party that he was at and he and I did hit it off right away. He was a very, very uh, congenial, uh, nice man, uh, easy to know, easy to talk to. And we did share a very similar sense of humor. Uh, we became good friends and went to a lot of events and things that we were both invited to. And and eventually it was suggested that I move into a guest cottage on the property. There it is, a state here in Palm Springs that had been previously a part of his mother's uh, residence there. I initially said no. And then, you know, I was over there so much for, for one party or another, one reason or another. And I just, I did take a second look at that cottage and had its own pool and its own everything. It was really beautiful. And I said, well, you know, okay, but I insist on paying rent or a lease payment. I don't want to be a house guest. And he said, at least said, I, I don't want your money. And I said, well, you know, it'd be nice to live here and, you know, we're all good friends. It'd be great, but I'd have to pay a lease payment. And he said, well, uh, you could make a contribution to my charity. He formed the Liberace Foundation for the Performing and Creative Arts in Las Vegas, I believe, in 1976. And what that charity did and, and still does is provide scholarships for deserving 
young uh, musicians and, and other creative people in the arts, provides encouragement and exposure and all kinds of assistance. And I was really intrigued with that charity. Uh, and uh, so I did. So every month I paid, uh, what was it, $550 to that charity. Well, as you may notice, Steve, I'm wearing something a little unusual for this interview. There's been a lot of comments from our viewers about my wardrobe lately, but I couldn't resist wearing something colorful. Do you think that Liberace would approve of this outfit? I think he sure would. He'd want to know where you got that shirt. That's definitely something he would wear. Okay, now I feel better. Well, yeah, Steve, looks great. thank you. I can well imagine that many people out there are wondering whether being a protege of Liberace's included being romantically or sexually involved with him. So I'm just going to ask you, were you ever his boyfriend? <laughs> no, no. Uh, people have asked that over the years. Not so much anymore these days, but back then people did. I guess they assumed that. Uh, especially because he started calling me uh, his protege. You know, I was a piano student of his. I lived on the property uh, at his home, but I was also a student of his and studied piano with him. So when he would use that, people don't always know what that word means. And it's just merely a, a student. And so, yeah, people uh, asked about that or thought that or assumed that. And no, no, you know, and... It was never even a thought uh, to him. It was never even a, a thought to me. We were just really good friends and had the same sense of humor. And he had a boyfriend. And uh, I had one after the other after the other in those days. He well, I'm glad guy. I got that out of the way. Let's put it that I'll way. You, I'll, I'll tell you this much. And I thought this at the time. I started thinking this in maybe 1981 knowingly up close and personal at home. Had he not been rich and famous, had he just been uh, Lee Liberace, the plumber, you know, or Lee Liberace, the accountant, I probably would have dated him because he was a very, very handsome man. Uh, off camera, he was very masculine. He worked out all the time. He was smart. He was smart about people. He was smart about business and economics and he was a fascinating, handsome man. The problem would, for me would have been he was rich and famous. That's that's a death knell to any relationship. Believe me, it's I've done it. I've dated other well-known people, and it's just, it just always gets in the way. They think you're a gold digger. You know, it, it it doesn't work. Had he not been famous, I might have you know asked him out. Well, I think. Given the way he died, I'm glad you didn't. Tell me the most important things you learned from Liberace about music and about show business and about life. I think I learned uh, everything I know today from Liberace. I was cognizant at the time that every day with him was something I was going to want to remember and want to use in future years of my own life. And so I made, you know, mental notes about things to remember this. And and uh, some of his advice took decades to make sense. But uh, he taught me about decency. He taught me, not that I was a jerk, but I mean, you know, his example of how to treat people in business, how to treat people on the street uh, was eye-opening for me. And he was really exceptional. And, and I learned a lot from him. I will never be as uh, kind and generous and, and selfless as Liberace was, uh, but I can try. Uh, he was, he was marvelous. He really, any, you talk to anybody that knew him, they'll tell you the same thing. Liberace used to say, I don't give concerts. I host shows. Do you think right. that his onstage flamboyance caused the public to underestimate and underappreciate his real talent as a pianist? Yes, of course. And he said that, too. You know, he said that, too. That was uh, the price he paid for the fame that he had. 
He was a tremendous pianist. Uh, you know, he started out as a concert pianist, uh, performing as a featured soloist with the top symphonies in the nation. And back in the 1940s, I mean, the Fo Liberace Foundation today has the, the contracts to show you. Back in the 1940s, he was making $2,500 a week as a classical pianist with these symphonies and, and, his, and his own personal appearances. That was a lot of money in the 1940s, 2500 a week. Uh, then he, he, he went to Las Vegas and, and they paid him, you know, 10 times that uh, in the late 1940s. Uh, so he had to have the, the chops. He had to have the, the skill and be a, a serious pianist, which he was. It wasn't until the television show where it got a little bit more gimmicky, but uh, the uh, the public ate it up, and that it really wasn't until 1960, 61, where the flashy costumes uh, really took hold in his career. There's a wonderful story about you and Liberace going to a remote cowboy town outside Palm Springs and walking into a saloon filled with redneck cowboys. Can you tell our viewers about that experience, Steve? I love that story. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, north of Palm Springs here, there, there's a town called Joshua Tree and a neighboring town to that called Yucca Valley. And that ain't Palm Springs. Uh, that might be an hour drive away, but it's worlds away. Uh, the, out there are, you know, the real cowboys and the real ranch hands and uh, ranching life and it's different out there beautiful quite beautiful uh, but Liberace had uh, a, quite a car collection he had several uh, custom cars and antique cars at each home of his he had you know half a dozen houses around the nation well in Palm Springs he had one a special uh, customized Cadillac via Ritz stretched front end quite beautiful uh, that needed to be uh, exercised every few months. It needed to be, as all cars do, they need to be driven at high speeds on the on the highway for uh, several minutes to flush out the exhaust system and what have you. And he needed to do that with this car. And he calls me one night on my night off. Uh, I was performing at the Palm Springs Hilton Hotel. And I had a night off. He calls me in my cottage, the other side of the pool, and says, you know, I got to take this car out, but I have heard that there's a place uh, north of here, a town that's got uh, saloons and cowboys and and uh, ranches. And do you know anything about this? And I said, well, yeah, are you talking about Joshua Tree? And he said, that's it, that's it. That's and it. I said, okay, fine. So he says, you know, be ready in 15 minutes. Uh, so he shows up at my cottage do uh, door with his uh, house manager. They're both in big fur coats and acres of gold jewelry and diamonds. And I'm just in a leather jacket and jeans, you know. But So we head out in the car on the highway at night up to Joshua Tree. I'd never been there. I heard about it. And we pull up to this saloon. I mean, a real Western saloon. And there's, you know, these trucks and motorcycles and horses hitched up to the rail in front and there's a, a wooden sliding doors or swinging doors you know the entrance of the saloon and uh, we get out of the car and you know adjust ourselves and primp our hairsprayed hair we looked ridiculous harvey we looked like three queens going to a judy garland concert i mean come on this is way out of place right but we went anyway we go into the to the doorway, the swinging wooden saloon doors and is in between George and I, and, and we get in the doorway and just freeze because I'd never seen anything like it. It was a sea of cowboy hats and cigarette smoke and beer bottles and hooting and hollering and raising hell. It, as I found out later, it was it was uh, payday uh, that night, payday uh, at the local mill in town and. These guys wanted to get drunk and raise some help. Uh, so there we are standing in the doorway and it was a rough crowd, you know, and one person at the bar kind of looked over and noticed us and then, then two more and then half the bar then was looking at Liberace and they're staring and the music stopped 
And I thought, oh, God, they're going to kill us. They're going to kill us. You know, here we are. And uh, Lee stepped forward and went up to the bar and extended his hand to some roughneck and said, hello, I'm Liberace. What is your name? Uh, the place fell apart, you know, and they loved him. They were charmed by him. He was telling these guys dirty jokes and, and they're slapping him on the back, you know, and buying him drinks and buying him shots. And he's sitting there on the bar stool with all these cowboys around him, just listening to every word that he has to say. And it, it was really something to see the way he charmed dozens of these otherwise scary, scary guys. Uh, they they wanted to try on his fur coat and to see these, you know, big burly ranch hands trying on a fur coat from, uh, and then he tried on their cowboy hats. It, it was, it was some, I just sat there just amazed, amazed. He had that way with people, you know, he could win anybody over. Uh, it was a marvelous to see. I was just amazed. He had a good time. We all did it. And I had a, a great story to tell for years later. Well, I have to tell you, that story just blew me away. I can't even imagine. And it's really a testament to his charisma, his likability, his ability to win people over. I want right. to ask you now, Steve, did you ever talk with Liberace about his decision to remain in the closet, to never come out as being gay, even after he knew he had AIDS? Yes and no. Yes, but not at any great length. I'll tell you this. I, I thank you for asking that question, Harvey, because no one has asked me that question in all these years. And the truth is, he was going to. The truth is, and was it 1985, he decided to write a book, another book, uh, another autobiography. Uh, it eventually got uh, published a year later in 86. And he started writing that in longhand on a legal notepad, uh, several notepads. And in that, he decided to, it would be a long love letter to his public, to his fans, and tell them everything. And uh, I encouraged him to do that. I wasn't privy to everybody in his life, what they said, but I saw a few other people a couple other people encourage him also to do that, in which he just, you know, very matter of factly just told his life story, which is, you know, no different than yours or mine or anybody else's. He was just a human being, you know, and and he did, and he wrote that uh, and then sent it in. Uh, his manager, Seymour Heller, in Los Angeles, got wind of what was in that collection of legal pads and demanded to see it and because it had been sent in to this publisher who, yeah and discussions started back and forth and seymour's position was this is going to end your career uh the public's not going to like this and I, I can't book you it's my job to book you i can no longer do it if you're gonna if this is going to be out there and uh, don't do it there's you can't gain anything by doing this and I stayed out of that discussion at that point. And uh, I, you know, was in Japan doing a movie and I had some hit records of my own in Japan. So I was kind of busy with my own life there a lot of that year. Uh, so I stayed out of that argument. But Seymour won. Seymour was able to convince Lee that there was just no upside to this. And to take it out and make it, you know, an, another bland coffee table book. And that's exactly what it was. And uh, it's unfortunate. And uh, so, yeah, to answer your question, yes, I did talk with him, but not at any great length. Even when Liberace knew he was dying and he had AIDS, he still didn't come out. Is that because of the manager as well? Yeah, well, also nobody asked him to, you know. He was diagnosed, and let me think, I think it was 85, because it was it was late summer of 85 when he told me. Uh, that was very, 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 very sad. 
so he didn't have a lot of time from diagnosis to death uh, to come out. His only working was, see, he played Radio City, I think, once. He played Caesar's Palace for two weeks. He, I think he played Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. I think it was that summer. Could have been the one before. And that's it. Uh, the only other thing he did was uh, he taped an interview with Oprah Winfrey. Uh, it was when she was starting her uh, now legendary television show. He wanted to do her show. He was deathly ill. I mean, deathly ill when her people uh, approached him and offered for him to come to Chicago to do the show. Uh, he saw something in her and he told everybody, this lady's going to go somewhere. This lady's going to be a star. I want to do her show. And, you know, she was, she was a news reporter from Kentucky or Tennessee or something like that. And nobody shared his vision in his household, his vision of Oprah Winfrey, but him. He said, she's going to be a star. I better do her show. Well, he's throwing up day and night, you know, diarrhea day and night. He can't walk across the room without the diarrhea and the, and the throwing up and, the, and he can't keep food down. And, and then he's dehydrated and the, you know, he's got an IV and he's got just to keep him vertical. And there's just no way you could, you couldn't even get him to the airport, let alone put him on the air. And uh, everybody's just telling him no, no, no. And, you know, with anyone, you, me, or Liberace, you have enough people telling you you can't do something. That instinct kicks in. Where, you, God damn it, I'm going to do it. Shut up. You don't tell me what to do. I'm going to do it. And that kicked in with him. We all saw it. And, you know, he reached out to other doctors and got uh, vitamin B12 shots and, and uh, other shots that would stop the uh, throwing up and stop the diarrhea just long enough to do that show. And... You know, he had specialty care uh, nurses 24-7. Uh, they were AIDS care nurses that uh, lived with him, traveled with him, were with him 24 hours a day. Two, two young guys out of L.A. It was their job to take care of him, be his live-in nurses, and see him through his, uh, his disease. They did not want him to go to Chicago. They didn't see it was possible. Well, they did. They all went. A uh, private plane. Uh, I think Oprah played uh, paid for that uh, private jet uh, to get to Chicago, check into a hotel. Lee was able to walk from the taxi to the uh, lobby of the hotel and up the elevator. He's able to do that. He goes to the uh, studio to film uh, after getting more injections of B12 and whatever, and in a wheelchair and uh, oxygen tank. And then uh, when he goes on set for that interview, the oxygen tank was taken away, the wheelchair disappeared, and he was magic. You look at the video of it now, it's remarkable. Yes, he was thin. Yes, he was pale. But look at that spark in his eye. It was his last hurrah uh, before the television cameras, before he died. And he knew it. And he gave his all for Oprah. And he was funny, and he was bright, and he was quick, and he was witty, and he was honest, for the most part, honest, you know. He was uh, engaging, and still his, his trademark optimism and his trademark appreciation for being alive and his appreciation for the wonderful life that his fans have given him. All of that, all of that was evident in that interview. And he did that. I don't know how long it took to tape that, but maybe an hour, maybe less. And then uh, when it was over, he gets back in the wheelchair and, uh, you know, he never recovered after that. Uh, he, I don't think he really had much of two sentences he could put together after that interview. That was done in October, late October, and then aired on Christmas Day of 1986. And he passed away on February the 4th, 1987. I understand that you were 
actually there at his home when he passed away. What happened? Tell me about those final days. It's so unlike Liberace. You know, he spent 67 years presenting himself as, uh, you know, upbeat and, and optimistic and fun. You never once would associate uh, sickness and death and dying with Liberace. It just didn't, they didn't go together, right? I was uh, in Japan at a, the film was a hit. My first uh, record was a hit. I was doing a television series there, bilingual, Japanese and, and, and American English. When uh, it was a relative of mine called me and said, uh, Lee is very sick. Maybe you want to call Seymour Heller. And uh, so I did. And Seymour told me this is it. You know, he's going to, he doesn't have very long to live. And it didn't sink in. You know, it didn't sink in. I, I said, well, they've said that before. How about another vitamin B12 shot? And uh, they, Seymour said, no, if you want to see him, you want to see him now. That was about one o'clock in the morning when I had that conversation. By six o'clock in the morning, I was dressed, had a bag packed, and I was at the airport in Osaka, Japan. Flew home. Uh, an uncle of mine picked me up at the airport. I I drove, uh, this is February 2nd, 1987. I drove to the house, but instead of going to my cottage, which is kind of around the corner, I drove the car straight into Lee's uh, driveway and park. They didn't prepare me for the fact that there were 600 people 600 people outside in front of this house holding uh, candles and in silence. And uh, many of them, I'd say most of them, from the UK. There were people from the United States, the Midwest and the South, one or two from the Palm Springs area, but there were hundreds from Great There were hundreds of good people from Great Britain that flew, flew, paid for those airline tickets, got a hotel room, and flew to be there for Liberace because of the fun and the, the enjoyment, the entertainment he had given them for so many years on, the, on his TV shows and the BBC. I looked at these people. I got out of my car. I could hear their accents, you know, and and it was one after the other after the other. I'm hearing these accents from from the UK. And I'm just standing there listening to them talk to each other about how much Liberace meant to him, them. And remember when he did this on his show, when he did that, he had this guest or that guest. And I was struck that here we were in Palm Springs, California, but 10,000 miles away or more. He was a big deal in their lives. How is that possible? And I just was amazed at their personal sacrifice, what these lovely people, they're not young either, what these lovely people did to just show this man some respect. He was never going to walk out the door and give him a kiss and a hug and say thank you for coming. No, they knew that. But they just wanted to be there anyway. God bless every one of them. Oh, more than 600 of them, Harvey. And sure, the press was there, CNN and uh, all these other press was there, uh, the BBC. I went in the door. I uh, walked in the house. There was, oh, eight or 10 people. And uh, the usual... Uh, staff, the staff from the Las Vegas properties and the Los Angeles properties were all brought in. Lee's sister was there, Angie. His attorney, his wonderful, wonderful uh, personal attorney, Joel Strote, was there. Joel served him uh, in his uh, legal needs and his contractual needs and his uh, estate planning and will needs for decades. Uh, Joel Strote was there. His uh, neighbors, uh, Good friends of his were there, and all the lights were out, and the the uh, drapes uh, were drawn. It was very dim in there, I guess because of all the press outside. You know, they've been trying to take 
pictures through the windows. It, and did you go and see Lee? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, right away. I did. And surprisingly, he looked real, real good on the 2nd of February. He did. He was perspiring a bit. And he had the uh, oxygen tube thing on his nose and the tank. He was laying on the uh, sofa. There's a recline, uh, sectional, a gray sectional. The next day, they brought in a hospital bed for him. But when I saw him, he was laying on the, on the couch in pajamas. And he looked good. And uh, I had brought one of his favorite flowers. I got to a florist. So I brought him flowers. I sat on the sofa next to him. And I sat on the floor right next to the sofa. And uh, I just held his hand the whole time we were talking. And he didn't talk a lot. I don't know how to describe it. But he was uh, very gentle, very simple, very childlike. Uh, you know, there was no excitement to his voice. Uh, but he was clear and he could ask questions and so did. what did you and, say to him steve well a whole lot of things i don't remember how long we talked but it was it was a while he asked me about japan my my career and my records and and we talked about that and he was real real pleased with the success i was having you know because he he taught me uh, a lot of skills i didn't have before knowing him and so i was able to use the musical skills for uh, commercial success you know we talked about that i did tell him because you could you could hear the crowd murmuring uh, through the uh, the glass windows uh, even though there was they were frosted glass you could hear them and i told him that there was over 600 people outside and uh, he he thought that was really great and he said, are they always there? And I said, day and night, day and night, they're always there. And uh, he, he thought that was remarkable. We talked about, he asked about an arrangement. Uh, the last arrangement he wrote for me was uh, a unique arrangement. It was a medley of El, El Comboncero and Malagueña. Put them two together, back and forth, back and forth. And he asked if I had mastered that. And I told him that I did when in fact i had not it was i was still working on it it was a very very difficult uh, arrangement but i for some reason i i wanted to make him happy and i told him that uh, yes i finally did master it and it's in the show uh, when it wasn't uh, it, it later became in the show yeah it's always my closing number uh, for the next uh, 20 years after that so, Steve, we were you able to say everything you wanted to say to him about what he meant to you? Yes, 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 yes. That wasn't my intention, but, you know, he and I had always had a very open, very honest, very direct friendship. So conversations like that uh, uh, were easy to, uh, easy to, easy to do. Yeah, I, I was able to thank him and I don't recall thinking he was going to die. I just recall thinking this, that he was sick and this was a time to, you know, tell him how much his friendship uh, meant to me. Uh, and I did. That was on February 2nd. Uh, th there was a nurse, a private nurse, another one, a new one that was brought in. And she came in the room and said something about, you know, he's been talking for quite a few minutes with you. He might need to rest. And so I said, well, Lee, uh, I'm going to go put my luggage in, in my cottage and I'll come back after dinner. Uh, but I, I'm here in town for the next few days. I'll, I'll be back. Okay. And he squeezed my hand. And uh, that was on the late afternoon of February 2nd. Uh, I left uh, the den where he was at and uh, joined a few people in the living room. I did go back uh, that evening, and but he was asleep uh, the next day and so on. And They said he was not in a coma, but he was kind of asleep. 
it looked like a coma, but he was rapidly going downhill. And I'll tell you this, Harvey, he was dying of emphysema. And when he did die, on uh, the morning of the 4th of February, he died of emphysema. He had uh, AIDS-related complex, ARC, which uh, one way to describe it is if you have other ailments in you, the, the AIDS will make those ailments worse and you'll die quicker from, from those ailments. It's not that so much that AIDS will kill you, it's that it will find another disease that will. Yes, that's and, right, because AIDS allows for opportunistic infections. I want yes. to ask you now, Steve, there's been a lot said and written about Liberace's many relationships, especially the one with Scott Thorson, which became very public when Scott launched a palimony suit. What can you tell us about Lee's relationship with Scott Thorson? That was probably the, the, the one honest, true love of Liberace's life. Uh, Lee always said that. You know, much has been, like you say, much has been said and written about Scott Thorson, and it's, it's just unkind. You know, I I was there. I saw them together. You know, they were like an old married couple. They loved each other very, very much. I know there was an age difference. I know that. But honest to God, Harvey, Scott Thorson was not with Lee for the money. He wasn't. He really well, then, did love him. Why did he sue him? because Lee put him out on the street with nothing. Scott got involved with the drugs and then got involved with drug people. And that scared Liberace and it scared Liberace's friends. It scared Liberace's manager. It scared me. It scared the, the household staff uh, because it's scary people and drug deals. And this is not normal in Liberace's world. And Everybody, everybody was telling Lee, you got to get rid of this guy. You know, he's embarrassing you. He's he's done terrible things in, in your show. I mean, uh, Scott, you know, was stoned out of his mind on Quaaludes and, and drove the, the Rolls Royce off the stage in Las Vegas Hilton, uh, drove the front wheel off into the audience and nearly it could have killed someone because Scott was just loaded uh, on whatever. Uh, yes, he did terrible things, but everybody was telling Lee, you you got to break up with this guy and get him out of your life. Lee would not listen to anybody, wouldn't listen to me, anybody. Until finally, after enough of this, he did. And as Lee had told some of his close employees, the most important thing to me is my show. That's what brings in all the money. That's what I have. I don't have hit records. I don't have a movie career. I have a show. Somebody's going to, excuse my language, Harvey, but this is what he said. Somebody's going to fuck with my show. Uh, they're gone. And, and and Scott was at the point of, of doing that. So and, what did you think of the lawsuit? Were you around for all of that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I was with Liberace in Palm Springs the morning that Scott was put out of the penthouse in Los Angeles. It was in March. I remember it well. I remember it happening. He sued Lee for 160 something million dollars because he claimed that Liberace promised to take care of him the rest of his life. And that's why he was suing him. Well, okay. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Is it worth 165 million? I don't know. It's going to be up to a jury to decide, isn't it? I was surprised that he went public like that. But at the same time, everything that Scott Thorson said about his his relationship with Lee was true, Harvey. Uh, Liberace did want to adopt him. Lee told me that himself. He did have Scott go through the plastic surgery to look like him, look like Lee. He did this. And he, all the wild claims that Scott said in his lawsuit were true, and Lee knew they were true. Uh, so, you know, he did out Lee. He did, and that's, I didn't think that was good at the time. But, you know, in retrospect, that uh, brouhaha 
that lawsuit brought Liberace a whole new audience. It brought him new fame. It brought him a new audience of younger people. Prior to that, Liberace was a Las Vegas act known to older people, old ladies, and some television talk shows. After the Scott Thorson thing went public, uh, Liberace is now known by a whole new generation of people the world over. And he was able to fill Radio City Music Hall. You know, thousands of people break records at music at Radio City Music Hall, break records everywhere he played. So that publicity, as ugly as it was, uh, served him very, very well in the long run. But I get the feeling that you don't harbor any ill will towards Scott Thorson. That's the no. sense I get that you you have some compassion for him. I do. And and uh, if and when I see him again, I want to apologize to him because I was not fair to him. We We all were unfair. You know, what their marital problems were, what what their relationship ups and downs are is their own business. And we should have left it to be their business. Uh, Lee loved Scott right to the end. Uh, Lee kept Scott in his will to the tune of, you know, a million something and nearly $2 million plus a house, plus cars, plus dogs, kept him in his will to, to nearly his dying day. It was only until a few weeks before he died, that everybody was able to convince Lee to take Scott out of his will, uh, that he was a bad person. That's the only reason Scott was not in the last uh, draft of the, of the will, last will and testament. I was, I was harsh. We all were harsh towards Scott. Looking back, you know, they loved each other. Scott was not a gold digger. He wasn't there for the money after all. And he was put out on the street with a drug addiction and uh, no roof over his head uh, simply because they had a lover's quarrel, a lover's fight. So who am I to be judgmental, really? Uh, the thing about uh, Liberace's friends, Harvey, if you talk to others, and there's a few of us still alive. As Terry Clarkson is a wonderful guy. He's still around as Lee's uh, costume manager. Joel Strote, uh, Liberace's attorney. There's a, a few of us. Uh, you talk to anybody, everybody wanted to protect Lee. Everybody felt protective of him and wanted to keep him away from trouble and troublesome people and, and, and isolate him from bad things. And, and that's what we were all doing. But in truth, we should have just let them have their relationship and stayed out of it, really. Do you think Liberace was ever truly happy in his personal life? Oh yes, absolutely he was. Absolutely. He was he was he was never unhappy except when he had to realize he had a terminal illness. That was the only only time he was unhappy. He loved his life, Harvey. He did. He loved his fans. He loved being famous. He loved being rich. He loved music, he loved uh, show business, he loved putting on a show. He loved getting before an audience, and he was he'd, he'd finish two big shows in Las Vegas and have the energy to go out and do another two if they asked him. He loved his life. He really did. And he was always appreciative of his fans and what they provided for him. He was uh, always consistently an upbeat guy. It was only uh, the last uh, year or year and a half of his life when he's having to emotionally face the fact that this is it, that he uh, became unhappy at times. Well, very understandably. Now, as you know, Steve, there have been three TV movies about Liberace. There was Liberace starring Andrew Robinson. Then there was Liberace behind the music starring Victor Garber. And then, of course, there was Behind the Candelabra starring Michael Douglas and Matt Damon. Did you see those movies? Yes. What did you think of them? The one with Garber was very good and very close to realism to what happened. The others were fiction. And the problem is, is, is the public, the world's public, will look at those and think that's real. They're going to think that's really what happened. That's a shame because they were fiction. 
I was associated with Behind the Candelabra years before Michael Douglas. Scott was writing that, he started to write that and hired a ghost writer in, oh, maybe five months after breaking up with Lee. And he called the house and he told the house manager who told Lee, who told me that he wanted to write this book and wanted to call it Behind the Candelabra. And not to worry that he was just going to tell the truth. He's not going to say anything. He's not going to tell this secret or that secret. He's going to tell his truth. And honest to God, Harvey, he needed another $5,000 for an editor or something. Her name was Jackie Story. And she needed $5,000 to do the work on his manuscript. And uh, he asked uh, Lee for this. And he did. And Lee should realize that he would want the story told truthfully by someone who was there rather than a third party who was going to make up all kinds of damaging things. I thought, what balls does that take for Scott to ask for Liberace in 1982 for $5,000 for this tell-all book? What balls? Oh, my God. And I, I went, you know, oh, my God, to the staff and everybody around the house who just kind of looked at me. Lee told Lucille Cunningham, his, his bookkeeper, accountant, secretary in Las Vegas, to cut him a check for $5,000. And she did. That's the truth. So he wasn't too upset. But the movie with Michael Douglas and Matt Damon, you're saying, was full of untruths? It eventually became that way. The screenplay then got purchased by Nicolas Cage. Uh, Nicolas Cage was going to produce it and, and, and star as Liberace through his company Saturn Films in Los Angeles. In the course of their research, they discovered me. And they found that I was performing at the St. Regis Hotel, both in New York and in California. And they reached out to me and wanted me to uh, serve as a consultant and guide them as to what is accurate and what is not. And I did. I did uh, for more than a year, maybe two years, until such time that Nicolas Cage lost that project, was not financially able to see it through fruition. And it went into the hands of Michael Douglas, who then is all over Los Angeles trying to get financing to make it happen. It was not an easy uh, road for him, but he did it on his own. He didn't want uh, Nicolas Cage or Saturn Films or Steve Gary to help him in any way. It was his project. He's going to do it. And he did. As ridiculous as it was, it was a cartoon. It was a cartoon, Harvey. That's just not the way things happened. That's not the way Lee was. But Michael Douglas won an Oscar. He won a Golden Globe. So, you know, I'm standing all alone here by myself saying it was a piece of crap, aren't I? Uh, how can I argue with an Oscar and, and millions of hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue? Who am I to argue and say it was crap? But I will still do it. I'll stand here and say, I'm sorry. It was, it was not the way things happened. Well, then let me ask you, Steve, what do you think is the biggest public misconception about Liberace? That he walked around uh, flamboyant and effeminate uh, all day in his personal life. Uh, you know, that he, he wore elaborate uh, costumes uh, and, and that he was uh, effeminate and, and ultra gay. And no, he wasn't. He was extremely a masculine guy uh, when he was off stage and off camera. That's just incredible. Thing, I mean, that that is really just incredible because everything we ever saw, he was, I mean, he made me look butch. I remember, I have to tell you this, Steve. Well, now, Harvey, let's not get carried away. I have to tell you, Steve, when I was trying to figure out who I was back when I was 18, I thought I was probably gay, but the only gay person I had ever heard of that I was pretty sure was gay was Liberace. And I looked at him on TV and thought, 
but I'm not like that. So maybe I'm not gay. So I have Liberace to thank for my own personal confusion way back then. So you're saying that in his personal life, he was actually a, a macho guy? Yes, he was. Yes, he was. And you can see uh, glimpses of that, uh, the real him, in certain interviews he had that are online on YouTube right now. Uh, he did an interview with 60 Minutes, which uh, was taped over a very long evening, where he's drinking vodka tonics and had a little too many, actually. And you can see the real him. There's a few interviews out there. The last one he did with uh, Oprah is is pretty indicative of how he was off camera. He he was, you know, he wasn't Arnold Schwarzenegger, but, you know, he was a normal guy. He wasn't flamboyant at all. Well, that's he, a real, real eye opener. Did Liberace ever give you any special gifts, like maybe one of his candelabras? Yeah, two of them. Yeah, he did. He did. I was performing at the, uh, I was about to open at the Palm Springs Hilton. And I'd been studying with him for a couple of years. And he told me that he was bringing a group of people in for my opening night. And I said, oh, okay. And I'm thinking, you know, I didn't invite him. You know, who wants their piano teacher there the first time they're opening? I come in the second night or the third night, you know? God, I've got enough to worry about, enough to be nervous about. He's going to critique every single note I play. Yeah, but he said, bringing pe he said he's bringing people in. Okay, fine. He comes over to my cottage about late afternoon with a, he says, you're going to need a, a candelabra. If you, you know, people know you've been studying with me, they're going to expect this. And uh, I said, well, that's, that's your trademark. It's not mine. He says, they're going to expect it uh, here. And he hands me a, candelabra that had been in the dining room of his main house there and and candles and said here just put this on the piano and i did and he came in and he was having dinner in the dining room with his group of people and uh he introduced me uh when i went on at nine o'clock we had a full house and uh, he got up he was wearing just a casual uh, open college shirt and introduced me to the crowd and said that I was, uh, you know, his best student so far. And he's proud to call me his. He was proud to call me his protege and that I had quite a future ahead. And, uh, you know, he didn't have to do that. He could have kept eating dinner, Harvey. He didn't have to do that. But he said wonderful things. I was standing at the bar next to the bartender. The bartender looked over at me and said, wow, I didn't know you were such a big deal. And I said, I didn't know either. He was so kind and he did that to me and he did that to make sure that I was a success at my job with the Hilton. And, and then he brought in other celebrities and then the Hilton took notice of the fact that when they had Steve Gary performing there, they're going to have celebrities in the audience and more customers showed up just to see the stars. And suddenly I'm a success because of my following, my celebrity following. And Lee did that on purpose. He did that on purpose for me, Harvey, and just to help 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 me be more sec secure in my in my uh, career. And uh, he called me a, his protege uh, there in the introduction, and 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 I have used that ever since. Well, you know, he obviously really respected your talent, and yeah. he clearly really liked you very much. He he knew that you were sincere. You were a real friend. And yeah. although you are Liberace's protege, you are not a copycat or an imitator. But are there times when you're performing, Steve, that you can feel yourself channeling Liberace? My God, you asked the questions, Harvey. My God, Harvey. You know, I've done interviews since 1976. And I usually know what they're going to ask before they ask. And sometimes they'll come up with some original questions. But Harvey, you are just over the top. You get right to it. And you ask the important uh, questions that I thought were secrets that nobody would know. And I'll answer your question. After he died, yes. After he died, I found that the public expected the Liberace show from me. 
I wasn't going to be a copy of him. But I, I, I did start to do the, uh, the elaborate costumes, five costume changes per show. Had my own orchestra, my own musical director. We performed uh, a 90 minute uh, show in tribute to Liberace. I'm not impersonating him. I wasn't uh, dressed up to look like him. I was a, a nod to him. And what the whole show was, was a thank you. Because I wanted to show the public what he taught me. And for six years, I studied with this guy and three, four times a year, you know, and I wanted to show and demonstrate what it was he taught me. And I did. And yes, I had the, the candelabras. There was another candelabra that uh, he gave me for home that he put on my desk in my cottage that had been a gift to him from his mother. It's an old, beautiful, ornate candelabra. And yes, I use those in the show, various shows around the world. And as I would be playing these songs, playing his arrangements, I had to kind of play them like he did because uh, I know that's what the public wanted. So I would do that. And now and then, Harvey, I could feel him just over this shoulder looking down at the keys and going, uh-huh, uh-huh. I'd miss a note. He'd go, oops. And uh-huh, uh-huh. He wore a, a cologne. It was distinctive. And sometimes uh, his breath would smell of vodka and tonic. I was performing in Norfolk, Virginia for a full theater of people. And I'm playing his his stuff in his way, and I'm smelling his cologne and vodka. I don't know how that's possible. Does your memory? Do you remember sense? And your memory plays games with you, and you and 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 you, you suddenly remember those smells. How does that happen? Or was he there? Uh, there was another time I, I, and you know, I have to keep playing. I can't. I can't stop and get emotional. That song keeps going because the band keeps playing. I got to finish it, right? I can't let on what's happening to the audience. There was a time I'm doing a, a TV thing for CBS television here in the U.S. And uh, uh, we filmed it at his home in 2005. And I have to run quickly around a uh, hallway to change costumes into something else. And as I'm making the turn around the hallway, there he is standing there looking at, looking at me like, like this, so proud of me. And then he's gone. He's just for a second, he's like this, it's a big smile and gone. I've got a whole production. I got a TV crew. I got everybody out there. We're live. We're going. I can't stop. I can't be emotional. I can't go looking around. Where did that image go? Where did it, was it a ghost? What was I? I can't do anything but continue to change clothes, get back out there, do the next song. Yeah, those to answer your questions, that did happen. And well, I uh, have to tell you, it doesn't surprise me because I've heard of this before. I know I have felt the presence of departed loved ones myself. So it doesn't surprise me. Now, I understand you were chosen by both the Liberace Estate and the Liberace Museum and Foundation to accept a Lifetime Achievement Award that was bestowed on Liberace after his death. That must have been a very proud moment for you, Steve. Yes, it was. We have it on video, too. It was the ASPCA, SPCA, the Animal Rights uh, Group, you know, here in the United States. It was them. And, you know, uh, their, their honorees were really big, big stars, Doris Day and uh, and some some real big shots, you know, movie stars and political heroes and such, and and they uh, chose Liberace and and then uh, contacted me, and I immediately reached out to the chairman of the Liberace Foundation for the Performing and Creative Arts at their office in Las Vegas, and said, you know, I've been asked to do that. I didn't ask to accept that. They reached out to me. What do we do? What do we do? And they said, there'd be nobody better than you to accept this for Lee. Would you do it? And I did. 
And, you know, he was an early, early advocate for animal rights and for uh, animal rescue, dog and cat rescue. Uh, he put his money where his mouth was early, early on, in the 1950s and 60s, and funding animal shelters. The first animal shelter in Palm Springs, not the one they have now, but the first one, he put up uh, most of the money to get that uh, to be a proper facility. Uh, and that was thousands and thousands of dollars. He did that. And it was not a popular cause back then. It is now, but it wasn't then. He was an early pioneer. He was concerned with legislation that would establish animal rights. He was quite comprehensive in that. He deserved that uh, award. And uh, and then I, I took it to the museum myself and, and they put it on display. They still have it now. And well, I think uh, he would be very happy to know that you were the one that accepted the award on his behalf. Now, of course, uh, in our remaining moments, I I must ask you about Frank Sinatra. Did you ever get to know Frank Sinatra, the person beyond Frank Sinatra, the performer? Yeah, uh, as much as anybody could, I suppose. He was a very, very, very complex person. Uh, yeah, I knew him privately. What happened was I was playing the Canyon Hotel in Palm Springs, which is the, the best hotel in town in the 1970s. And he played there too, but he played the main room. I played the lounge. He brought a group of people in to hear me in the lounge one night. Myself and my uh, drummer were playing. And he brought in, we were full. Uh, and uh, he wanted to come in. Suddenly, a table and chairs uh, appeared out of nowhere and were set up in the back for him. He brought in Henry Kissinger, who was our Secretary of State in the U.S., and uh, uh, Mike Connors, is that his name? He was the star of the Mannix TV show. Telly Savalas. He was a, a table full of equally famous people. And I had uh, always been doing his material, uh, his big Cole Porter hits, I've Got You Under My Skin, and night and day and so on. that's what I did that's what we all did in Palm Springs in those days and but there was a rule in Palm Springs that if Mr. Sinatra were to come in when you're playing don't ask him up to sing and especially don't play his songs you know don't do that he's already heard them he's recorded them He's done them better than you can, so don't play his song. Don't play him by the way with Frank Sinatra there trying to cut his food. Don't do that. And everybody obeyed that rule. But there I was at, you know, 19 or 20 years old, the Canyon Hotel. I got a full room of people to please. And I can get a standing ovation from these people because I can do these songs well. So am I going to sacrifice my, my own audience and my own self by playing something else? No. No, I made a decision right then and there to do what I do every night. And that's Sinatra stuff, Dean Barton stuff, Bobby Darren stuff, Ella Fitzgerald stuff, that. And the, the, the staff was shocked. The bartenders looking at me from across the room going, stop that, stop that. The, the servers are in, everybody's in shock. The people in the audience are now looking over at Sinatra's table uh, for his reaction. Is he gonna? Is he gonna get mad? Uh, Sinatra stood up and 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 said, "You're doing great, kid." Uh, with that, that gave me license to do uh, whatever I wanted in this town. Word got around fast. We had mutual friends. Uh, Sinatra invited me to his home one afternoon, sitting out by the pool. He had a beer. I don't remember what I had. I met his wife. We went to the post office one time, pretty normal things, you know, there was one after, I think it was the last time I saw him, one afternoon, his former chief of uh, security, Jerry Foley, and a friend of Jerry's and I, and uh, Frank, we went to a coffee shop here in town, late afternoon, uh, Sinatra wore a ball cap and sunglasses, and they didn't know who he was. 
and we were there. We we're talking about I was playing Maxime's in Paris. I was about about to play that, and he gave me some advice about stage fright and. Uh, so yeah, he was a, a pretty normal guy. I knew him that way. He, uh, one afternoon at the Canyon Hotel, he came in at opening time, about five o'clock in the afternoon, came up to the piano and, and says, give me an E flat. And I did. He's going like this. So, you know, we start playing in tempo and uh, he starts singing. And he sang three or four songs with me. And he was amazed that I knew the old, 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 old songs. And I did. And he sang old songs like It Had to Be You, I'll See You in My Dreams uh, from the 1920s and 19-teens. And he had a, a blast. The, the people there, whenever Sinatra would be in the room, especially if he got up to sing, nobody left. Nobody left. Uh, they got quite quite a show because Sinatra didn't sing half-assed. He put his all into every single time he sang a song. It, it was tremendous. I loved every minute of it. Well, what a life that you've lived, Steve. Do you think you'll ever write a memoir? Because you got to know these two legends and you've worked with so many others. I mean, you've performed for five presidents, Presidents Ford, Reagan, Bush Sr., Clinton, and Bush Jr. You played at the Live Aid concert in London. How about writing a book? It's possible if people are interested. Yeah, yeah. The Live Aid thing was a satellite from different parts around the world. They may have been based in London, but I did the one in Asia. And then I did their follow-up, which was Sport Aid, which is also a satellite around the world. Yeah. Well, how much can I tell in a book? Does the public really want to hear the truth? Yeah. I dated. Yes. I have a personal life, too. I have a personal life. I was married twice. My late husband, here's his ring. My late husband and I were, were married or were together a, a total of 28 years. I have a personal life. Before I was married, I dated a very well-known uh, drummer in a famous rock band. I dated a, a well-known actor. Both of them household name. One of them, well, both of them actually. I dated when I was uh, living at Liberace's house. Lee knew everything. Do those two guys, do their fans want to hear me say, you know, here's what happened? They don't. They don't. One's still alive, the other one isn't. But I'd be crucified if I told the truth because they don't want to think of of their famous celebrity as being gay or being bisexual, uh, having sex with, with a guy. They don't want to envision that. Okay, and, so you uh, could just write the book about Liberace and Frank Sinatra. That would be enough for me, I'll tell you. And I hope, if you do, that you will come back on our show to promote that book. How about that? Sure. Yeah. Well, I Steve, it very much. I look forward it, to that. Thank you. Me too. It's been a real pleasure meeting you, having this chance to reminisce about your amazing life and career. I think you are doing an amazing job of keeping the legacies of Frank Sinatra and Liberace alive. I know you've had some health problems in recent years. I know you don't give a lot of interviews since then. I so appreciate that you chose to be on our show. Thank you so much, Steve, for taking the time to appear on our show. Well, thank you, Harvey, for everything, and especially for your interest in Liberace and what a good guy he was. And I, I know your, your audience uh, understands what a good guy he was. The important thing is to remember that Liberace's uh, goodness continues to this day through the great work that the Liberace Foundation for the Performing and Creative Arts is doing their uh, website, www.liberace.org, is tremendous. You can catch up on everything they're doing. They're doing exactly what uh, Lee would want. Uh, and it's, uh, it's just marvelous and it's exciting to see the, the work the Liberace Foundation is doing. Their current uh, chairman is Jonathan Warren, who's just a blessing to Liberace fans everywhere. He's just a great guy. And I encourage everybody to take a minute 
and go visit Liberace.org too. Thank you so much for mentioning that. Again, the website for the Liberace Foundation is liberace.org. Our guest has been pianist and entertainer extraordinaire Steve Gary. To learn more about Steve Gary and to buy his CDs, please go to his official website, stevegary.com. You can also subscribe to his YouTube channel, Official Steve Gary. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my managers, Rick Marcelli and Robin Bragg Marcelli at the Marcelli Company in Hollywood, my director of programming, Robert Monaghan, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.